Good evening, everybody. This is Patricia Blick, Executive Director of the QQA, and this is our second uh, foray into recording our first June preservation conversation, the Razorback Wing of the Commemorative Air Force by Robert Lashbrook. As I mentioned, I'm Patricia Blick, Executive Director of the QQA, and I'm joined by Shelley Stormo, our Membership and Abort Events Coordinator. And though she's not here right now, I'd like to recognize Ann Ballard Bryan, who helped us put this program together. As always, I want to thank our donors and our members who make preservation conversations possible. If you're not a member of the QQA, we invite you to join. You can do this for as little as $35 a year, and you can just join or make a donation at quapaw.com. All right, on to our preservation conversation, the Razorback Wing of the Commemorative Air Force by Robert Lashbrook. I am pleased to introduce our speaker. Rob is a native Arkansan and grew up in Little Rock, after completing high school at Catholic High School for Boys, Rob accepted an appointment to the United States Military Academy at West Point, graduating with a Bachelor of Science in Aerospace Engineering and a commission as an Army Aviation Officer. In 2004, when Rob separated from active duty Army and joined the Arkansas Army National Guard, he began his civilian career as a production and certification test pilot with business jet manufacturer Dassault Falcon Jet. He is currently the Director of Flight Operations, responsible for managing the production flight testing of all new Falcon business jet models, including the Falcon 2000, Falcon 900, and Falcon 7X, 8X. Due to his passion for aviation and military history, after Rob's military retirement, he joined the Commemorative Air Force Razorback Wing and is currently serving as a pilot of the PT-22 Recruit and Wing Executive Officer. Rob is married to his wife, Nicole. They have two children, Anne, age 20, and Will, age 17, and they live in Little Rock. Please join me in welcoming Rob. Hey, uh, good evening, everyone. Again, I'm uh, Rob Lashbrook. I, as uh, Patricia said, I'm the Executive Officer of the uh, uh, Razorback Wing of the Commemorative Air Force, and I'm here to discuss with you all uh, our preservation project the Ryan PT-22 recruit airplane. And uh, I will talk a little bit about the Razorback wing of the Commemorative Air Force here in Little Rock. Uh, I'll introduce you to our airplane. I will talk about the history of World War II uh, aviation uh, in Arkansas and the Commemorative Air Force uh, organization and the Razorback wing itself. I'll talk more deeply about the history of our airplane, uh, its history, how we acquired it and what we're doing with it now. And then I'll uh, ask her some questions if you all would like to ask them. So I will take control of the screen here and um, show you the, and we'll begin our presentation. Okay, so you all should be able to see the screen now. Um, and I should have control of it. Let me double check. Stand by. It looks good from this end. Yep, there you go. Okay, great. So we'll begin by introducing you to our airplane. Uh, our airplane is a Ryan PT-22 recruit. Uh, this airplane was uh, designed by the company called Ryan Aeronautical. Uh, many of you that are aviation buffs may know the name Ryan uh, because that is the same manufacturer who manufactured the Spirit of St. Louis that Charles Lindbergh used to uh, for his solo crossing of the Atlantic. Um, and uh, this airplane was originally manufactured uh, by Ryan as a civilian airplane. Uh, they called it the Ryan ST, and it was uh, developed in the mid-1930s. Uh, the Ryan ST, the ST stood for sport and trainer. Um, originally, the, uh, the airplane was purely a civilian airplane, but in the, uh, around 1940, 1941, the uh, Army Air Corps recognized that um, they needed a slightly more advanced trainer for primary training for aviation cadets than they had previously been using. Uh, previously, they'd primarily relied up on the Boeing Stearman airplane, the PT-17 or PT-13 Stearman, which is a biplane, still a very good training airplane. Uh, and it was used primarily in World War II as well. But the second most prominent airplane was this Ryan PT-22 recruit that the Army Air Corps purchased uh, uh, 
in the 1940 range. Uh, but when the Army Air Corps purchased the airplane uh, as, a, as a civilian airplane, they had to make some modifications uh, to make it more suitable for military training. So um, it originally had a Manesco four-cylinder inline 95 horsepower engine on it. Uh, that was not robust enough for the military. So they modified the engine and put the uh, five-cylinder Kenner uh, radial engine on it at 160 horsepower. Um, they also uh, greatly strengthened the landing gear. As you can look down at the picture there, you can see the landing gear has a lot of struts going to it. Uh, used primarily as a military trainer, they wanted to strengthen that landing gear, uh, and they did that quite a bit. Uh, they also made the cockpit slightly larger uh, to accommodate uh, military cadets with flight suits and parachutes uh, to be able to get in and out of the airplane. And one of the significant aerodynamic changes I made to the airplane when the military purchased it was to sweep the wings back about four degrees. Uh, the original Ryan ST uh, the wing was perpendicular to the fuselage. Uh, the military swept it back about four degrees, and that was due to some aerodynamic issues they had when they changed the weights of the airplane with the addition of the engine and the cockpit movement uh, moving around. Uh, that resulted in some interesting aerodynamic effects that we'll talk about briefly in a minute. Um, so the military took the airplane and uh, it was, they were used mostly on the West Coast in California for primary training for military cadets in the 1940s. Um, and it did, as I mentioned before, had a rep have a reputation here uh, being difficult to handle, uh, primarily because of this four degree sweep uh, of the wing, it made its stall characteristics a little bit more aggressive than you might find in a more tame training airplane like a, like a Boeing Stearman. Uh, but uh, suffice it to say, it was a very good training airplane uh, for cadets during World War II. Here's a look at the cockpit of our airplane. Uh, as you can see there, just by looking at it, it's very, very basic. Um, there's not much to it. It's made to teach cadets how to basically fly, take off, and land uh, an airplane. Um, just to introduce you to the, the cockpit there, you can see on the left-hand side is there the altimeter, just a pressure altimeter to know how high you are. In the center there is the airspeed indicator in miles per hour. Uh, slightly to the right there is the propeller RPM or, or revolutions per minute. And then the two smaller gauges on the right, one is oil pressure, oil temperature. And then the, the uh, other indicator above the airspeed indicator is just a magnetic compass. It's a, simply a magnetic compass sitting in fluid. Uh, to, to point uh, your, your cardinal directions there. Uh, the only other thing you'll see there that's, that's uh, I didn't mention uh, that we, that was added actually during the restoration of the airplane is the radio at the very, at the bottom there. Um, and that radio would not have been in the original airplane. Uh, they had um, little tubes they would speak to between the front and the back pilot. They would literally speak into a tube back and forth and they'd put the tube to their ear so they could, they could hear. It was really that, that rudimentary. We actually have a radio in this airplane, and that is the only thing on this airplane that has any electrical component or any electricity going to it at all. We have a small rechargeable battery in the back of the airplane that links to that radio. Uh, and beyond that, there is nothing on the airplane that requires electricity at all, which is uh, very interesting. So here's a picture of our airplane and my, uh, one of our other wing members, my brother Jeremy, working on it. The reason I show this picture is to mention one of the, the maintenance of the airplane. Uh, because it is a World War II era airplane and it's a primary trainer, it's relatively simple to maintain, uh, but finding parts and experienced maintainers is very difficult sometimes because the parts are becoming rarer and rarer. And maintenance technicians that actually can work on these types of engines and this, this type of airplane with a fabric covered uh, wing are becoming more rare. Um, for example, one of our challenges right now is the engine itself, this uh, Kenner five cylinder radial engine, is, uh, has an overhaul time frame of about 750 to 800 hours time between it should be overhauled. Uh, our engine has about 600 hours on it currently. So we would need to overhaul this engine in about another 150 hours. Uh, and that's difficult because there's only a couple of people in the US that have the ability, skills, and time to do the overhauls for this engine. So um, one of the things that we're trying to do right now is, is purchase an engine a, uh, for the airplane so that when this engine runs out of its overhaul time, we have a brand new, uh, freshly overhauled engine we could put on it to extend this airplane's life into the 
long foreseeable future. Uh, but the, an engine for an airplane like this, just the engine itself is about a $35,000 purchase for the engine. So that's one of the things we're trying to do as the Commemorative Air Force Wing here in Arkansas is collect funds uh, through our ride program and through don generous donations and memberships uh, to help uh, keep this airplane flying. So I'll talk briefly now about the history of uh, World War II aviation in Arkansas to kind of show a connection between Arkansas and what we're doing here at the Commemorative Air Force. Uh, the photograph here is in Walnut Ridge, Arkansas. Uh, Walnut Ridge, Arkansas is a uh, municipal airport. It is airport is still there. It was a World War II uh, airport that was used for depot level uh, maintenance and storage of airplanes. Uh, and at one time, uh, at, shortly after World War II, uh, Walnut Ridge had the largest supply of airplanes in one location, probably than anywhere else in the world. Uh, because after World War II, obviously, our military had a large surplus of uh, military airplanes, and there was simply no use for them anymore. And so they would fly them to Walnut Ridge, and they would put them into a smelter and destroy them. And there are some people that say that many of them were just dug into holes and buried. And there are air airplanes that are buried out there at Walnut Ridge to this day. And that's a picture right there of the of a Curtis P-40 Warhawk fighter airplanes that are at Walnut Ridge awaiting the smelter or awaiting being buried. Um, it's a sad it's a sad thing to look at, but in the 19 late 40s, early 50s, they had simply no other way to get rid of these airplanes. Another Photograph there. That's again Walnut Ridge, Arkansas. Uh, the U.S. military produced over 300,000 aircraft during World War II, uh, and because of these activities that the military performed at Walnut Ridge uh, to uh, destroy these airplanes, by 1955, literally 10 years after the after the war, they were almost all gone. And I'll show you here, and this is Walnut Ridge, Arkansas, an aerial view of airplanes that are simply parked there. As I mentioned, at one point, Walnut Ridge was probably the, uh, the uh, location where more airplanes were stored in one place than anywhere else in the world. Um, and that's a, that's, a, that's a lot of airplanes out there. Uh, supposedly, at one time, there were over 10,000 airplanes parked there. Um, and Walnut Ridge, as I mentioned, is still a civilian airport today, and they have a museum that commemorates uh, their, their history in World War II. Uh, it's an interesting museum if you ever get a chance to go up there. And so what happened at Walnut Ridge and other places in the U.S. is the reason why the Commemorative Air Force was created. Um, it exists to preserve, maintain, and fly these historic airplanes uh, that helped save Europe and defeat Japan. Um, the CAF was founded in 1957. So at the, you know, at the, the end of this destruction of these airplanes by a group of former military pilots uh, who bought a single airplane, they bought one airplane, a P-51 Mustang fighter in Texas, and they uh, called themselves at the time, it was called the Confederate Air Force. It's kind of a tongue-in-cheek um, reference to uh, the Confederate Army, of course, in the, in the, the Civil War. Uh, obviously, we've since changed that name for, for obvious reasons, but uh, uh, the Commemorative Air Force in 1957 was, was incorporated or was founded, it was incorporated in 1961. Um, and over time, they've acquired airplanes and more airplanes. And by, um, by 1961, they had a museum when they incorporated in Harlingen, Texas. And they're now one of the largest uh, air forces in, in the world. They have over 13,000 members and 175 aircraft across the United States, and they're in 26 states and four foreign countries, uh, where it's a nonprofit organization that uh, supports the restoration of uh, and preservation of these airplanes. Uh, and again, the CAF mission is to acquire, preserve, and flying condition, a complete collection of aircraft uh, for education, enjoyment for the present and future generations. That's what, what we do in the CAF. Here, is a photograph probably from the 19, late 1970s, early 80s uh, at Pine Bluff, Arkansas. This was the original uh, Razorback wing of the CAF. It was a very active wing in the 70s and 80s. Um, and it was operational probably until the early 90s. 
And it was located at Pine Bluff's Grider Field, uh, which of course is still there as a municipal airport. It was also a World War II training airfield. Um, and they held air shows there in Pine Bluff for many years and operated several World War II airplanes. And those of you that are airplane buffs can look around and see a P-51 Mustang there, a B-29 bomber, looks like a B-25 Mitchell bomber, uh, AT-6 Texans, uh, looks like a T, uh, T-26 uh, Invader. So uh, a lot of interesting airplanes were out there at that time in, in, in Pine Bluff. But as I mentioned, uh, due to probably financial reasons, the wing closed down in the early 90s. But we established the wing uh, here in North Little Rock Airport in 2017. And there's our airplane right there. Uh, Miss Cherie is the name of the airplane. I'll talk more about that uh, as we get into the history of the airplane. So uh, just to tell you where this information comes from, uh, one of the previous owners of the airplane petitioned uh, the Smithsonian for the military records of our airplane, Miss Cherie, the PT-22 recruit that we fly. And everything I'm going to show you going forward here about the airplane was gathered from these records from the Smithsonian about the, uh, the history of our airplane. Um, our airplane was first based uh, in Visalia, California at an Army Airfield training base. It was purchased in 1942, as you can see there on the slide, and it was purchased for $8,581 uh, by the Army Air Corps, and it remained in service there in Visalia, California for three years training pilots. Here you can see the uh, military service card of the airplane documenting the flights of the airplane there in Visalia during training. Um, and it, you can see there, if you do the math, or you can look down at the bottom there, it flew a total of 503 hours of flight training in 1941 or 42 uh, through 1944, I believe, in California. It was involved in one accident in, in uh, 1944 in January. Um, what happened there is the pilot, you can see his name is Albert Morton, was an aviation cadet, and he experienced an engine failure on the airplane. But fortunately, he was trained well, and so he glided the airplane to a safe landing, and there were no injuries and no damage to the airplane. And here, as you can see, there's the bill of sale of the airplane, where the uh, Army Air Corps offered the airplane a surplus in 1945, and it was sold to a civilian buyer, if you can read that, for $875 in 1945. Uh, from the time it was purchased there as a civilian buyer, it by a civilian buyer, it was flown uh, by several owners, primarily in California and Arizona until 1957. So about 13 years it flew as, uh, as a civilian airplane in Arizona and California. But interestingly enough, in 1957, uh, the owner at the time decided to disassemble the airplane and completely rebuild it to refurbish the entire airplane. Um, it's a great thing that he did it. Um, but as you'll see here in, in a second, uh, this restoration project uh, was not as simple or as, as a timely as probably he would have liked, uh, because this gentleman who decided to rebuild the airplane started in 1957, and it was not completed until 1990. Uh, so it was a this airplane was grounded and in maintenance from 1957 to 1990. So... Uh, the owner who did this refurbishment claims that 99% of the original reconditioned parts remained on the airplane. So it's a very authentic Ryan PT-22. It has beautiful fabric work and excellent craftsmanship. So in some ways, we're very happy it took him as long as it did to uh, rebuild the airplane. Um, so after he it was rebuilt, the airplane was transferred to the Commemorative Air Force. Uh, it was transferred to the Old Dominion Wing of the Commemorative Air Force in Virginia. And it flew with that wing from the mid 1990s to about 2013. So about 20 years it flew in the Old Dominion wing of the Commemorative Air, Air Force. And then for unknown reasons, uh, the Old Dominion wing decided they no longer wanted the airplane or no longer had need for it. Um, and so they transferred it back to the Commemorative Air Force headquarters in, in Texas. So the airplane flew to Texas, it was put into Commemorative Air Force hangar and it sat there uh, from 2013, not flying uh, until the Razorback Wing, we began to ask for airplanes. Um, so it sat in, uh, in Texas for about five years, 
And then when we reestablished the commemorative Air Force Wing in uh, Arkansas at North Little Rock in 2017, we petitioned the CAF for an airplane. Um, now, I will tell you that normally when this happens, uh, it, you can go years without being granted an airplane, uh, simply because there may not be one available or one suitable. Um, another option is they give you, most likely, they give you a project. Uh, they usually don't give you flying airplanes. They say, here, we have pieces and parts of an airplane that needs to be rebuilt. Uh, it needs an engine. It needs to be fabric recovered. It needs all this maintenance work. And here's everything you need kind of to, to get a kit started to, to do this work. But if you want a flying airplane for your wing, you need to do this work. And it's essentially done on a volunteer basis. So that's normally how it works. Uh, but fortunately, uh, this airplane was sitting uh, in Texas at the time. The wing was reestablished here in Arkansas, and they gave us this, this, this airplane that was almost completely in a flying status. As I'll talk about in a minute, it wasn't completely there, but it was very, very close. And so um, here's another picture of the airplane. Um, one of the reasons why we were able to successfully get this airplane is we did have one CAF member in our wing uh, who's in his 70s, who had previously flown a PT-22 as, uh, uh, as a teenager. Uh, I think a friend of the family owned one or a friend uh, of, of, uh, of someone close to them uh, had a PT-22 and uh, was able, and this one member of our wing uh, had flown it previously. Also, fortunately, uh, we had several members of our wing that had previous experience, although not in the PT-22, in other similar World War II type airplanes with the radial engines, the tail wheel configuration, um, and the fabric covered wings. So we had some experience generally in these types of airplanes before, and we had some uh, a mechanic who felt comfortable working on the airplanes. So those things kind of came together uh, at the time the airplane was available to us and we were able to, uh, to acquire it from the uh, from headquarters. So there's one of the members of our wing who uh, went down to Texas to look at our airplane. Um, and as you can see, uh, we just went down there to look at it to say what it would take to get flying. Again, it hadn't flown in over five years from when we, were, when we uh, uh, were able to get it. So we sent members of our wing to Texas and just did a thorough inspection of the airplane to see what it was gonna take. There is the airplane sitting in Texas uh, with a part of the cowling off the airplane to inspect it. And so this is during the second trip that our members of our wing took. Um, and so the group changed the oil in the airplane and they decided to try to start this engine that hadn't been ran in over five years. Um, and as I mentioned before, this airplane has no electrical system. So it has no starter. It has no engine primer uh, to, to, to prime the engine. Uh, so in order to start this airplane, it's a little bit of a convoluted process, and it requires uh, what's known as hand propping. And that's exactly what it sounds like, and it's exactly as dangerous as it sounds like, uh, where it literally takes a, an individual to swing the propeller uh, with his hands to get the, uh, the propeller moving, to get the spark to, to fire and the engine to start. Um, and so that process is not simple process. So the members had to call other people who own PT-22s and to ask them how you do this, what you do to get this set up and how to make this work. But fortunately, uh, we were successful in getting it started uh, on this second trip. But uh, we found out that during the, uh, the engine operation that the, uh, one of the cylinders was cracked, was damaged. Uh, it had been sitting with uh, likely water had developed in it. It had been sitting and maybe rusted a little bit. So we had to do some, uh, some repair work on the engine uh, on the third trip in order to get the engine back into a state that was airworthy to fly. And I after a total of five trips back and forth to Dallas to uh, get the airplane into a state we felt comfortable with, one of our pilots uh, was uh, checked out in the airplane by uh, another instructor that happened to be in the Commemorative Air Force there in Dallas. Uh, he was checked out as the, the pilot of the airplane, and they flew that airplane uh, from Dallas, Texas, back to uh, North Little Rock, Arkansas, uh, at 100 miles an hour. So it was a, it's, it's a long trip, but we were able to get it flying. First time the airplane had flown, well, they checked him out in it previously and then flew it back to Little Rock, uh, really the second or third flight of the airplane in five years. 
And there's our airplane in our humble hangar at North Little Rock Municipal Airport with members of our wing. And they're very proud to have it and proud to get to work on it. And as you can see, uh, because this airplane is uh, an aluminum uh, airplane, uh, a lot of shining and buffing of the airplane is necessary to get it looking pretty. We polished and uh, sanded and revarnished the propeller, beautiful wooden uh, propeller on the airplane. And that's the actually balancing process right there. Once you finish varnishing the airplane, obviously the, you don't want the propeller to be unbalanced. There could be a lot of vibration going on. So you hang the propeller by its center there and uh, balance both uh, propeller blades to make sure that uh, you won't get any vibration. And then once we were happy with that, we began checking out our pilots. Uh, this is the second pilot to be qualified. He happened to be the one that had flown a PT-22 in his, as, a, as a teenager. So after just 60, 50, 50 to 60 years of not flying a PT-22, we were able to qualify him in the airplane again. Another one of our pilots to be qualified in the airplane. Uh, and one of the interesting uh, notes we happen to have now is we have a total of five pilots qualified to fly this airplane in our wing. All five of them are former military uh, veterans, uh, vet military veterans, former military uh, pilots. So we're very happy to say that uh, without a requirement, of course, but we are a very veteran friendly organization, obviously, and all of our pilots are currently military veterans. And then once we were able to get pilots qualified, get the airplane in a flyable state, we began to show it off uh, and do what we do. Um, as you all that are in the nonprofit business are, are well aware, um, in order to operate, we have to do it via uh, the donation of either time, talent, or treasure. Uh, and in order to, to acquire those things, you have to show the airplane off and make people interested in it. So here's the airplane at a, uh, a Fayetteville, Arkansas, at a Bikes, Blues, and Barbecue event. It's right next to one of its sister trainers, as I mentioned before, that's the Boeing uh, Stearman primary trainer biplane that's just in the, in the uh, other side of our PT-22 there. And the Boeing Stearman, as I mentioned, was the number one trainer used during World War II. And the reason why the, uh, our uh, PT-22 was acquired was to find something that's slightly more, uh, more challenging for primary cadets. So there's a Boeing Stearman and the Boeing PT-22 that trained tens of thousands of military aviators during uh, World War II. Here's our airplane again. We've flown it again to several fly-ins and other events uh, as we first got, to, got the airplane. Uh, here it is at, um, I think that's Wings Over Bryant Air Show uh, in 2021. Uh, and we flew it there with several other World War II airplanes. Uh, as the airplane that's taking this picture is a, a AT-6 Texan World War II advanced trainer right next to our PT-22, our Orion PT-22. There's some members of our wing again at Wings Over Bryant in 2021. We again flew the airplane uh, to Mount Pettigene for another fly-in event in uh, 2021. Um, and as you can see, the airplane is absolutely beautiful and it's well-maintained, well-cared for. Um, I don't have a photograph here because it just happened yesterday, but we also flew the airplane in the Wings Over Bryant 2022. Uh, so the airplane flew there and we set up our community of Air Force booth uh, to uh, just increase the enjoyment and awareness of the, the uh, sacrifices our veterans made during World War II and preserving this history. Um, and you, you can see by these photographs of the airplane flying all over Arkansas, uh, there is no doubt that our uh, PT-22 Miss Cherie is uh, living her best life here now uh, as we have it in Razorback Wing. There's a starting the airplane uh, at, uh, when, uh, this is at uh, Mount Pettigene. And as you can see there, that's part of the hand propping process to get the airplane started. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, we, we exist either with people donating to help support this airplane or we have, a, and associated with that, we have a ride program as well, where we uh, offer rides uh, of the, in the airplane, short 20 minute rides, kind of familiarization rides uh, in exchange for a $200 donation to our wing. So our PT-22 is a rare uh, historic airplane. There are probably only about 150 flying in the world today. 
Uh, and uh, we cannot maintain our airplane without support of generous people and people who just love, uh, love aviation. So that uh, is the end of my presentation about our beautiful PT-22 in the Commemorative Air Force Razorback Wing. If you've got any questions, uh, please, uh, please share. That is lovely. And I was wondering if you all participated in the, um, in the um, wings over Brian over this weekend. So that's, it and you get a nice, you get a nice weekend. I was going to say hot, airplane, but, but it was, was very hot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but we flew, we sure did. Well, that's great. And I mean, the weather was good. Right. And yeah. um, it, we had a little bit, we were at the lake and we had a little bit of rain yesterday afternoon, but, um, but other than that, it would seem like a pretty clear weekend. So I have compiled the questions that we had at our original program. So I'm just going to go through those. And um, certainly if you think of things that you'd also like to add, don't hesitate to do that too. Sure. So uh, one of the first questions we had, and this came up a couple of times, was, the, um, was there history of the WASP training on these aircraft, the P20, PT-22? And then also sort of following along with that, not everyone in the audience knew what the WASP wasp were so if you could elaborate on that a little bit that'd be great sure uh, the the wasps was an acronym for the women's army service pilots um, and that was a group of female aviators during world war ii um, that primarily their job was behind the lines flying these airplanes both to ferry them uh, back and forth for a variety of reasons up to uh, the combat zones uh, and also to do maintenance test flying of the airplane, production test flying of the airplane. So um, they were very active during World War II, um, a large uh, organization of thousand, thousands of women uh, who flew these airplanes. I have no direct record of this airplane or the PT-22 in general uh, being flown by WASPs, but I have absolutely no doubt that women Army service pilots flew the PT-22 at some time sometime in, in the history in World War II. So it's pretty likely. Uh, oh, without, without in, a doubt, they flew the yeah, airplane yeah. at some point. Yeah. Um, probably not this specific airplane, but uh, they certainly were very, very active. And they flew, they flew everything, everything the military had. Right, yeah. which is awesome. Yeah. Um, oh, this is the question that also came up. Why is it called Miss Cherie? Yes. Um, it's a little vague on that one. When the airplane was transferred from the owner that restored it, to the Commemorative Air Force Old Dominion Wing in Virginia. At that point, it was, re it was named Miss Cherie. Uh, we believe that one of the uh, members of that wing's uh, wife's name was Cherie, uh, and he named it after her. And of course, we're not, we're not superstitious, but we certainly don't want to change the name someone's bestowed upon that airplane, and it seems to fit very well. And, uh, and so I think Miss Cherie is a beautiful name for a beautiful airplane. That's lovely. That is lovely. Um, are you planning on adding another plane to the Razorback Wing? Um, that's that's difficult to say now. Um, right now, we need our wing to grow a little bit. Um, getting an airplane itself is is although not simple. Uh, that's one of the the tip of the iceberg to having these airplanes able to fly. You have to have a place to hanger the airplane, a uh, place to uh, to maintain the airplane. Um, and you have to be able to, I don't want to say make money, but you have to be able to support the airplane uh, um, through the donation program. So we are certainly open to other airplanes, um, but we're very cautious about growing beyond our ability to support ourselves. So um, we would love to have a, probably in the future, if we had a wish, it would be a more capable airplane, in which case we would may give uh, Miss Cherie back to the uh, headquarters and take a more capable airplane. And then at some point, if we get big enough, we have enough membership and enough uh, people that are interested and able to help support the airplanes, we could certainly have two. There are wings uh, that are especially most, many of them in California, they have three, four, five airplanes, but they're very large wings. So elaborate a little bit more. When you say a more capable airplane, something that's faster, something that's uh, sturdier, what, what would that, what qualifies to being more capable? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Something that's easier to operate on a regular basis in order to take the air shows and use in our ride program can actually fly further. Um, as I've kind of alluded to before, the engine on this airplane is, you know, a five cylinder Kenner engine. These engines were made in the 19th, late 30s, early 40s. 
It's maintained very, very well, but it is an old airplane. And so we're very cautious with it. We don't take it super long distances. In fact, we probably would not take it outside the state of Arkansas for any events unless there was some real uh, support package we could, we could manage to follow along with it. Yeah. Um, we don't fly the airplane anywhere that if the engine were to quit, we couldn't get on the ground safely. So we don't fly over large bodies of water. We don't fly over large forested areas. We try to stick to either close around by airports or by interstates, just in case something were to happen that we can't foresee because this is an old airplane. Uh, plus, as I mentioned, it doesn't have a starter on it. So every time we shut the engine down, it takes this hand propping process to get started again. So a more capable airplane would be a, a BT-13, which is a slightly more advanced trainer, or an AT-6 Texan, which is the advanced trainer in World War II, that has an electrical system. It has, it's a faster airplane. It had, carries more fuel, uh, so we can go further, and we can actually carry passengers easier on that airplane, because this airplane is weight limited in some ways. So just something more capable and uh, ability for us to, to fly without having to worry so much about maintaining uh, the safety of the airplane. Understood. Well, and and that sort of also led to some other questions from the, the audience, you know, uh, it, the idea of getting another plane, what what do you anticipate the cost would be? And also you've mentioned other trainers. What about a combat, um, yeah. an actual combat plane? Is that even an option or what are those limitations too? Yeah. Um, so the cost of these airplanes uh, varies dramatically um, b based on the state of the airplane. As I mentioned earlier, um, normally when these airplanes are assigned to a wing, they're assigned as projects. And they can, and those projects uh, can be either assigned to the wing uh, or the wing itself can buy them from a private owner of the projects. And an airplane like a BT-13 or a T-6, a T-6 Texan, a project could be as little as, you know, maybe fifty to one hundred thousand dollars to purchase the project. And then you're going to put another hundred thousand dollars, maybe, into the restoration of the airplane, depending on how uh, how um, far along the project is already. So these airplanes, we're talking about hundred thousand dollars to maybe two hundred thousand dollars, all said and done, for a new airplane. Um, but that can vary greatly. Um, regarding uh, a fighter airplane or an actual combat airplane, we certainly have the skill sets and the ability in Little Rock to, uh, to maintain one and to support one. Um, but again, the cost is, is, is a lot. The World War II fighter airplanes now, uh, they can often be sold on the private market for close to a million dollars, believe it or not, because they're so rare and, and, and uh, collectors really love these airplanes. Um, but a project could be as little as five hundred, seven hundred thousand dollars. Um, but if the if the Commander Air Force headquarters had a project, they could just assign it to our wing without us costing us anything. But yet we have to restore it now. And again, that could be one hundred thousand dollars to restore the restore the project, yeah. if not more than that. So it is a, not an inexpensive undertaking. And, and I think one of the things you mentioned the other night too is, um, or maybe you can explain this. Um, so a person wants to gift you a plane, but it doesn't go to your wing necessarily, right? It goes to the commemorative air force. And then did they make the determination where it ends up or how yeah. is it? a yeah. Good question. Um, actually there, I, I believe that a, a private donor can make his decision of, of what he wants to do with his donation, whether that be an airplane or, or a financial donate donation. Our wing, the Razorback wing itself here in North Little Rock, can accept donations that would go earmarked directly for our wing. That can be done if that's the donor's wish. Um, or they can donate to the, to the national organization in Texas, in which case the national, that, that national organization can decide where the need is and where the ability to support that airplane or those donations are. Gotcha. Um, we also had questions about the material, and I know you talked a little bit about the body of the plane, but could you also talk about the wings because they're yes. kind of a unique yeah, yeah. treatment? As I mentioned the, the fuselage of the airplane is aluminum, polished aluminum. The wing itself is, they call it fabric, um, but it's really a almost like parachute looking uh, 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 polycarbonate type fabric that they wrap the airplane, the, 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 the wing in. Um, and it's got 
wooden uh, frame that's wrapped in this fabric. And then they, once the fabric is attached, they have a, what's called dope, which is almost like a syrupy like substance in a paintbrush. And they will apply this dope to the, to the wing um, to allow the fabric to kind of shrink up. And they even use heat guns to help shrink this fabric up and protect it. Um, and so if you actually come out and you see the airplane, you can touch that fabric and you can feel it's almost like a trampoline. It kind of just kind of bounces a little bit, but it's very, very sturdy and very strong. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned, this, uh, this wing was recovered in the 1990s whenever the, uh, the previous owner did his restoration and it's still an absolutely beautiful, pristine condition. So you don't have an ETA on when you think you're going to have to replace that. I mean, you just, you just kind of monitor it. And if it's in good shape, it's good to go. Exactly right. Um, the only thing that really has time life components on it is the engine. Okay. Uh, everything else is just based on its condition. Gotcha. So it's not the same after 500 hours, it has to be re Exactly right. or what have you gotcha um we also you mentioned it in, during your talk but maybe just reinforce how much does it cost if someone wanted to go on a ride with you yes uh, so we have a ride program we've established we've been very fortunate to establish that ride program uh, as a uh, um as you can imagine because we were offering rides to the general population uh, the faa has something to say about that and so they had us to comply with a rigorous uh, program to apply for this ride program that includes certain maintenance that they require us to document and all of our pilots have to be on a drug program where we have to have be drug tested periodically in order to do this legally and uh, after we meet all these requirements they granted us this letter of authorization to give rides um, and so what we offer is a 20 minute ride that's 20 minutes in the air uh, over the airplane for a donation of two hundred dollars to our commemorative air force wing and if anyone's interested in that, the easiest way to, to find that is to go to our Facebook page. It's Razorback uh, CAF, Commander Air Force Razorback Wing, uh, on Facebook. And you will see a link there to sign up for rides. There's also a message link there where you can message uh, the, the administrator of our website, our, of our Facebook page, and ask any questions you want about joining the wing, et cetera. Great. We also have a commemorativeairforce.org. Uh, 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 website, our uh, correction, that's the, that's the national website. The CAF uh, org website is a national website and our wing website is CAF Razorback wing arrow. Um, and you can go on that site as well. And it has, has links to, uh, to access uh, our wing and to get a hold of us. Great. Well, and, and certainly as we were looking for images to put together as we were promoting this event, we did come across many different wings um, of the commemorative Air, commemorative Air Force, but we're leaving your, your card up here so people will have that contact information for the future as well. So that is excellent. Um, so as you mentioned, you're in the always in the fundraising mode. One of our attendees asked if you would ever consider doing races like they used to do in the in the past, historically, where they would pit um, uh, planes against each other. I don't know if they would do one on one or if it was multiple, okay. but I know you had a, a little concern about the possibility of carrying out something like that. Yeah, in the um, air races were very popular in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Uh, and it was a very uh, common way for aircraft manufacturers to become known and become, and become more renowned, as well as pilots. And it was a way, actually, the trophy, some of the trophies, you could win some money in doing that. Um, this airplane, number one, is just not designed for that. It's not a fast airplane. It's not a good, uh, a good airplane, high performance airplane, uh, number one. And number two, um, even if it were, it were uh, placed against aircraft that are similar capabilities, this is a 70, 80, 80 year old airplane. So we are very, very cautious about how we treat it. And we certainly don't wanna push the engine or the airframe uh, anywhere close to its limits. We don't operate the, the airplane. It has, it's very capable. It's a robust, strong airplane for the military. We don't put it anywhere near the limits that it was designed for because we're taking very good care of it. Right. You want it to last. Yeah. Well, and that follow along was so maybe you're not doing one on one, but maybe something like a time trial. But still, it would be very, a very cautious exercise. Yeah. So so that's not really in your future at this time. Um, one of our one of our attendees wanted to know how do folks join the commemorative Air Force? Yes, absolutely. Um, again, the, the easiest way to find us is via our 
Facebook page. Uh, there's a message button there that if you send a message via that to ask the, for your interest, we, you will get a, you'll get a response email back shortly. Um, in addition to that, um, I'm gonna I will give you my my personal cell number. You feel free to reach out to me again. I'm Rob Lashbrook, and my cell number is five zero one nine one two six four two five. If anyone's interested in joining the wing or just wants more information, feel free to either text me or give me a call. But either our wing website, CAF Razorback Wing arrow, or probably better, our Facebook page. You can get a hold of any of us, and we'd be more than happy to share with you how to join our wing or how to donate or how to participate in some way. So tell me that number again. I'm going to put it in the chat so it'll be commemorated there. Yeah. Uh, 501. 501-912-6425. 912-6425. I That's had right. some of it correct, but not 100%. So very good. Okay, we'll put that on there. And that should stay with our recording as well. Um, are there any women? Do you have any women pilots as uh, part of your commemorative Air Force that are? I'm so are... sad to say we don't right now. Okay. Um, uh, we have have no women that in our in our wing right now, and um, we would. In fact, if there's any women listening right now that have interested in in World War II aviation, aviation in general, um, give me a give me a call, shoot us a text, uh, or a, or message us on our Facebook page. I'd love to hear from you and and uh, kind of get the word out uh, for everybody. Very good. So you're always recruiting too. Yeah. Um, and we know there are women pilots in the vicinity, you know, we have the air base near us, so we, right. we know they're out there and, um, work in the, in the field too. Um, do you all have any commemorative air force regular fly-ins? For example, do a lot of other wings get together on a regular basis? Do you have reunions? Is that something that you all participate in? Yeah, uh, uh, the answer is is yes, uh, but it's 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 sometimes complicated. The CAF headquarters in Dallas they do have an annual CAF air show. Uh, again, it will be it's difficult to fly this airplane that kind of distances without a lot of preparation. So yeah. uh, it would be hard for our airplane to attend that. Um, and then individual wings usually do their own thing. So an individual wing, let's say there's the I mentioned Old Dominion Wing in Virginia. They may do some fly-ins or some air shows that they may put on themselves, and they may or may not uh, communicate with other wings that are surrounding them. And it's really a strange thing that that, that communication doesn't happen very well. In fact, uh, there was one of the wings that operates bomber aircraft, and they fly around the U.S. doing air shows uh, for months at a time, just hopping around to different states. And one flew in one of the, the wings with a couple of airplanes flew into uh, Fayetteville, uh, Arkansas. And the only reason we knew about it is because we happened to notice they on the on the CAF page that they were doing that. And so we flew the airplane over there to join them and they were happy to have us there. But uh, we don't do a good job wing to wing communicating very well about what we're doing and we need to improve on that. So were you all the only um, CAF? Uh, representative at Wings Over Bryant this past weekend, or we, we were, yes, right. Okay, okay. So I was curious if anybody else had, um, if there were any other, maybe other vintage craft, maybe privately owned. But there were, there were, there uh -huh. were, there were several other privately owned vintage aircraft. There was mm -hmm. another uh, AT6 Texan. There was a P51 Mustang that's privately owned. Uh, so there were two or three other airplanes that were the same vintage as, as ours, uh, but we were the only CAF wing that was present. Gotcha. Um, so we had one of our members uh, in the audience the other night who was very technical and wanted to know the stall speed. <laughs> yes, uh, this airplane stall speed is 64 miles an hour uh, with the flaps up. Flaps up is what you see in the picture there now uh, where the wing is completely straight. Uh, there's no nothing hanging down below the wing. Um, 64 miles an hour. And then if the flaps are down, which would show kind of a bend in the wing and the, the back part of the wing, uh, you can slow down only two more miles an hour. You can go to 62 miles an hour before you stall the airplane. Very good. I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> um, so when the plane made its voyage from um, uh, Dallas to Little Rock, how many stops did it take when yeah, during that initial initial move? Yeah, they stopped two times. Um, they stopped, I believe, in 
Texarkana, and then one more stop, I think, in around Hope or just north of Hope to get it back to Arkansas. Uh, the airplane has uh, a um, only a range of about uh, 200 miles is about all it will do um, at 100 miles an hour. And it's only about, you know, it's a 20 gallon, 20 gallon fuel tank and it burns about 10 gallons an hour. Wow. So as wow. you can see there, yeah. you, you really don't have a whole lot of range there. So 200 miles is about all that we'll do. Uh, mm -hmm. And even that's pushing it. Wow. That's amazing. Um, and we, you touched on this a little bit during your talk um, because one of our, one of our audience members said, how long has it been called the Com commemorative air force? He recalled it had been known as the Confederate air force. And so you, you sort of explained that transition that took right, place right. a little while back. Yeah. Again, it was originally a tongue in cheek, uh, a reference to the, uh, the Confederate Army and, you know, one of the, uh, the mascots of the CAF back in the 60s uh, was, uh, was uh, uh, Colonel Culpepper, which was an invented person we know with the Confederate Air Force, uh, with a Confederate uh, uniform on that had wings and things like that. So it was kind of a, a you know, it's a tongue-in-cheek reference to uh, uh, Civil War Confederate Army, uh, but uh, obviously for obvious reasons uh, in, I believe it was the late 80s. Uh, it was wisely decided to, to make it more uh, representative of actually what we do commemorate these old these these old airplanes. Right, it did. You're right. It does seem very fitting. Um, and so the other the other question we had going back to the ridiculous level of surplus planes that were you know living their last few days in Walnut Ridge. You know, were they purchased by farmers? Every time I go to East Arkansas, I see crop dusters, and I'm thinking, heck, these must have been utilized or could have been utilized by um, industry. Um, so, did that happen? Yeah, yeah, um, it did for some of the types, but other types it didn't. And uh, essentially, uh, many of the combat aircraft, especially the fighters had really no other use. Um, they couldn't really be used for crop dusters or for uh, general transportation or any civilian uses because they were purpose built to be fighters. Um, a few of the airplanes happened to be fortunate enough to be versatile enough that they could be purchased and used for other, other reasons. Uh, one of those was the Boeing Stearman, uh, the biplane that I showed earlier. Um, it was very popular in the 1950s and 60s as a crop duster. Many, many of those uh, were purchased. They took the, the front seat out of the airplane. They put a hopper in there for uh, agricultural spray. They put spray kits on the wings. And throughout the 50s and 60s, up until really the 80s, you could go into South Arkansas and see Boeing Stearmans uh, with, um, with spray kits on them, crop dusting uh, all day long. They put even put bigger, bigger engines on them so they could carry more weight. Um, in addition, some of the other transport airplanes that the military had, uh, most prominently the C-47 Skytrain, which was a transport carrying airplane um, that was also well known for, for taking uh, the parachutists across uh, Normandy on D-Day. Uh, that was a very popular civilian airplane used in the airlines and used for cargo up until today. Um, so there are some that became very popular to be used because they had civilian usage uses, but many of them just simply were so purpose built for combat that they weren't used for that. There was nothing else they could be done with them. So they gotcha. just melted them. Yep. Yep. So recycled in a, in a different fashion. Yeah. Um, um, another question we had as we were kind of wrapping it up was, were there any Tuskegee airmen that were part of the army air corps? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Tuskegee airmen was a unique uh, squadron uh, established in World War II, early World War II, in order to essentially um, meet the need of combat aviators, number one. And number two, the Army wanted to take advantage of a, the, of a resource that we had not taken advantage of in the past, which was African-American aviators. Uh, so um, those aviators flew combat aircraft uh, in, in the European theater during World War II, a fighter aircraft. They were renowned for their success in defending the bombers, which is what the fighters usually did, uh, and protecting uh, the, uh, the air forces as they were moving to bomb their targets. Um, and I am, although again, I have no direct documentation of 
uh, Tuskegee Airmen flying the PT-22, I can't believe they wouldn't have it at some point simply because it was so prevalent. So it's likely, right, yeah, right. Likely. Well, that was the end of our questions. So did, was there anything else you want to add um, or share? Um, um, well, I, I want to I want to thank you again, Patricia, for for hosting us, allowing us to to uh, uh, to talk about our airplane. Uh, again, we're the Razorback Wing of the Commemorative Air Force. We're at North Little Rock Airport. And if anyone is interested at all in either donating or joining our wing, please reach out to us to us either via our Facebook page, our website, or uh, or feel free to give me a call or a text. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And thanks for doing a duplicate of our talk. Um, I think this will work out very well. Yeah. And I'll just I'll just add on the same comments I had the other night. Uh, we had a second preservation conversation on June 23rd to talk about the Murphy Jeffries building with the Jeffries sisters, Belinda Jeffries and Helen Jeffries and Stephanie and Myron Jackson. So we had a great we had a great program that night, too. Also promoting the summer suppers that are coming up this summer. We've sold out all of them, with the exception of the one on August 9th. That is at the uh, Stiff Station uh, Stone Stroh Brew Brewing Room. And um, it is uh, co-sponsored by Ian and Courtney uh, Beard and Ann and Jim Bryan and food will be by the um, Oyster Bar. So if you're interested in that, get on to quapaw.com and order a ticket. And then the last thing I was gonna mention is our, our 5-H club. That's gonna be gearing up on July the 8th for Fridays in July, 8, the 8th, the 15th, 22nd and 29th. And we are going to um, do the same thing we did last year, pop-up series where we uh, announce on Tuesday where it's going to be. We'll take 25 attendees. It is members only. So if you're not a member of the QQA, you need to join. And we can't wait to get those going. So anyway, thank you again, Rob, for rejoining me again on this talk about the Commemorative Air Force, which was great. And um, I hope you all have a good, good rest of your summer. Thank you. Take care. Bye, everybody.